Good morning, citizens. We're so thankful to be with you this morning. To all your moms, to all the beautiful women who have done so much for us, we thank you this morning. We want to sing a song of excitement, of joy, what God has done, because we see it in each one of you. So this morning, if you're willing, if you're able, stand up and let's sing and let's give praise to God for all the things he's done in our lives. It's always our springtime with you, making all things new. Your light is breaking through the dark. This love, it is sweeter than wine, bringing joy and new life. Your hope is rising like the dawn. Oh, it's coming alive in you, Jesus. Making all things new, your light is breaking through the dark. Your love is sweeter than wine, bringing joy to life. Your hope is rising like the dawn.
this is what you do, this is what you do. You make me come alive, this is what you do, this is what you do. You make me come alive, this is what you do, this is what you do. You make me come alive, you make me come alive. It's a new, it's a new season. Come on, pray that over yourself. It's a new season. Yes, it's a new season. You make all things new. All things new.
on every voice. Our hearts will cry, these bones they'll sing. Great are you, Lord. Oh. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones they'll sing. that you love us, for the things that you've done. God, that you've given us provision. That from the day we were born, we've been in the arms of the right people. It's not human. It's the right person. It's Jesus. We all make mistakes. We all have our issues, but it's your Holy Spirit that guides us. And as a father, that you've always been there, every step, all along the way. For those of us that don't have something to celebrate today, maybe those people are missing, maybe they've been missing. Today we celebrate you instead perfect father, perfect mother, perfect guidance, the perfect embrace. God, we look to you today, and we thank you, and it's in your name we will always pray. You 
just thank you so much for the words of that song, Lord. Lord, the fact that you take the broken and you raise them to life, God, you give us a second chance indefinitely, Lord, and we just praise you for that, Lord. God, thank you just for worship, God, just a place where we can just come to you, Lord, and sing praises to you. God, thank you just for everything that you do and that you will do. God, and we just pray as we continue, Lord, to just spend time with you this morning. God, we pray that as we hear the message, our hearts will be open, God, that our ears will just be obedient, Lord, to just listen to what the message is this morning. And um, I just pray for everybody, Lord, that's just going through something, Lord, in this time. God, we just, we pray for your grace, Lord. And um, Lord, we just pray that you would just come and change us, Lord, that you would raise us to life. And we love you. Amen. church. I just want to take a quick moment to remind everyone about the God we believe in. Scripture tells us that he's holy, that he's big, and that he is good. We know that he's a God who works things out for his people, and he loves us through all seasons and in all circumstances. At times, it's easy to get discouraged when we look at the difficulties in the world around us, but God is calling us to believe that his promises will prevail in our lives. Proverbs 35 tells us that every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. My encouragement to you is to believe that God's promises will prove true, that he loves you and that he's working things out on your behalf. Take refuge in him today and believe with us in what we're believing in God for you. All right, before we go any further with the service, I have something important to say. That is, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. We love our mother. about moms is no two moms are the same. Every mom has to, to uh, basically navigate, how do I do this mom thing? How do I do this parenting thing with the kids that God has given me, the unique, different human individuals that God has given me? And so no two moms are the same. I understand that, but that is not going to stop me from making some sweeping generalizations in my message today as we talk about moms and as we talk about the church. So just bear with me. Give me some grace. But we want to bless moms today. So for the first 10 moms who comment something on our Facebook or YouTube chat channels, something that you are thankful for that God has blessed you with in being a mom, thankful about your family, thankful about the kids that you have, thankful for the grace that God has given you in this season, whatever it is, go ahead and do a little praise report, and we're going to send you a $10 gift card to Starbucks uh, just so that you can make it through another week with a little shot of encouragement. So for the first 10 moms who go ahead and, and give a praise report, we're going to bless you that way. But um, I love moms. I want to shout out to the mother of my own children, Jenny, making the mom game look hot since 2004. Very thankful for her. I uh, also want to say, thank you, uh, say thanks and, and happy Mother's Day to my own mom, Susan, for those who don't know. Uh, that's her name. It sounds weird saying that, doesn't it? For all you people who call your mom or your dad or your parents by their first name, that's weird. But my mom's name is Susan, and I just want to say thank you, Mom, for being an amazing mother. I got to say, you nailed it. Uh, proof's in the pudding. I mean, one out of four ain't bad. Just saying. Um, but, you know, it's hard. It's hard raising kids in this world, and uh, I'm just grateful for all the moms. We love our moms, single moms, stay-at-home moms, uh, working uh, out-of-the-house moms, and now everybody's kind of a stay-at-home mom, I suppose. Uh, but now we have a whole new class of mom. They're called a corona mom, and these are moms who are so, uh, so fed up with their kids right now. They're so uh, tired of being cooped up in a house, and yet they still have the ability and the grace to be able to post pictures on Instagram about how peaceful and loving and wonderful their home is. And that takes, that takes a lot of hard work to maintain that level of positivity. And so we're thankful for that. And here is my obvious, shameless segue into my message titled, How It Works. One of the things I love about moms is that moms understand how it works. They understand what's going on with their family. They understand what it means to raise kids, how they have to put work in, how they have to, you know, from the very beginning, you know, they're, they're raising the, the child in their womb and they have to uh, plan ahead and get all the things and do all the things and they're looking ahead to school days and they're looking ahead to high school and college and beyond. Moms understand how it works. And so today... I'm talking about how it works with the church. 
We're in a message series called Plan A and how the church is God's plan A for the world. That's the capital C church, the people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, how the church is um, the, the way that God wants to bring about his glory and bring about uh, heaven on earth through his church. And so today we're talking about how it works. More specifically, why do we do what we do? What's the point? What's the point of all this church stuff? And I think it's especially a good question right now because we're trying to find, I, I'm, uh, I work with a lot of different pastors and, and I'm part of some networks, and we're all trying to figure out what's the best way forward for the church right now. And it begs the question, why are we doing what we're doing? And I know that a lot of people are starting to miss church, and when I say miss church, I mean miss the gathering. They're, they're starting to miss the worship experience, and I'm, I'm one of those. You know, I'm still here on Sundays, but I miss all of the things that, that we do, socializing and interacting and loving on one another and high fives and hugs and the whole shebang, and, and people are starting to miss that, and that's a good thing. That's okay, but if we only miss church because of the feeling we get when we gather, then we're missing something bigger because church is not about a feeling. I want to say that church is not a worship service. Church is the embodiment of the kingdom of God here on earth. That's you. I just raised your status up a notch. You're sitting at home in your pajamas and you're like, what, me? Yeah, you are the embodiment of the kingdom of God here on earth. In fact, the church is referred to as the body of Christ. And so it's more than a gathering, although gathering is important, and it's more than a feeling, although a feeling and an emotional response to God and to people is important. It's bigger than that. Why do we do what we do? See, we as individuals, we make up the body of Christ that is reaching out and reaching up to become like Christ, to reflect his glory, to make disciples, to represent the gospel, to imitate Christ. However you want to say that, our job is to be like Christ, not do church stuff. Our goal is to be like Christ. And so we do the church stuff, and the church stuff is important. What do I mean church stuff? Church stuff, I'm talking about giving, I'm talking about serving, I'm talking about gathering, attending, I'm talking about volunteering, I'm talking about going to special events, I'm talking about reaching out and helping people when they when they're need the help and when people are sick and we do the meal train thing and all of this other stuff that we do is the church. We do that stuff not because that is the goal of church. We do that stuff so that we can be like Christ. And, and that's why we do the things that we do. That's why our mission statement here at the church is transformation together. It's not feel good together, and it's not transformation in your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's transformation together because we have an understanding that we have a higher calling that requires us to be together, but it also requires us to be transformed into the image of Christ. It's a lot like a family. Moms are always wanting to keep everybody together. You notice that? It's like, come get together for the picture, get together for dinner, let's get together and go on a vacation, let's just be together. Moms want to get everyone together because they understand that when you're together, there's interaction that takes place and, and there's something that you can do and you can become more together than you can on your own. And so it's worth doing the work of bringing people together. And it is work. You know, you ever try to plan a birthday party or plan a family get together or worse yet, a family reunion? I mean, there's work involved, but there's some value that comes uh, out of that gathering, out of the things that we do. So too many Christians, I think, I, I want to talk about how it works, but we have to talk about the problem. What is, what is the problem that we're looking at that I think many Christians, and I think many people who aren't Christians, but who are looking at the church, is they have this issue with the church. They, they look at the whole, the whole church thing, and, and the problem is too many Christians forget why they're doing what they're doing for God. And this is similar to being a parent or a mom. It's like, you know, what is this all for sometimes? You think, why, why am I putting in all of this effort and all of these sleepless nights and all of this, this situation that, that is so difficult right in front of me? Why am I doing all this? Now, with a kid, you can quickly be reminded, you know, well, of course, I see my child and they love me. And we just saw in the video that we just watched, you know, all of the, the reward that's involved with that. But sometimes with our faith, it's a little bit harder. And, and what happens is we forget why we're doing what we're doing for God and we get burnt out and we get bitter and we get tired and we just want to be done with it. So we start to think, what am I getting out of this? What am I getting out of this? What is church 
doing for me. And so I'm happy to know that many people are missing church or missing the gathering aspect of church. And it's okay, we should miss it. We need each other. And we have a lot of fun, and it's okay to have a lot of fun. If you look at the Old Testament, uh, God prescribed tons of festivals and a lot of rest, and, and he wanted his people to be able to celebrate what God is doing in their life. And so it's okay to be missing church, but the problem with missing church is that it's not enough when the challenges come. The fun times and the good feelings are not enough when the challenges in life come and when the temptations come and even when the blessings come and start to try to pull you away. How many people have been distracted from being engaged with the body of Christ because of a blessing? I have a pastor friend tells me there's two ways to get people to leave your church. One is get them a job and two is get them a new new girlfriend or a spouse. Because you get blessed, and it's like, oh, you know what? I don't need God anymore. I got what I wanted. Or, and so for some of us, it's I came, and I, and I got the experience that I wanted. And if I can somehow replicate this experience, if I can somehow have this, this, uh, this uh, emotional response or this feeling that I get, then that's good enough for me. But what happens when it's not good enough? That's the problem that we have to address today. This is where we can learn from mom's approach. One of the best things about moms is that moms understand the long game. The long game. See, moms know what it means to plant a seed, then to water it, and then to feed it, and then to care for it, and then to prune it back sometimes, and to nurture it until growth. So raising your kids is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And you often don't see the result that you're looking for or waiting for until much later down the road. And so when kids are young, it's hard because you have to adjust. You know, when they're babies, you adjust to the sleeping pattern and changing diapers and all of this kind of stuff. And you, but the thing is, it's hard, but you see some immediate results because they're so cute. And it's so sweet to have them there and they cuddle with you and all of that. But then as your kids get a little bit older, it starts to get harder. And you have different types of uh, personalities emerge and different types of... uh, Uh, interactions with them that become difficult in a different kind of way. It's no longer sleepless nights. It's now you have sleepless nights, but it's not because the baby's crying. It's because you're worried about what's going to happen for the future of this child, and you start to get unsure about how your kids are going to turn out. But you have to keep the long game in mind because you realize that you're not raising kids. You're raising adults. The goal is to have a responsible, loving, full-of-character, awesome adult. And so we have some parents who try to keep their kids little forever. You know the ones, right? I'm not going to say how long uh, Jenny nursed our last child, but it was a little too long because he was the last one, and we wanted to make sure that he stayed little forever. And we want to do that with our kids, but we don't really try too hard because we know that if we kept them little forever, they would never grow up, and then when they finally did age out and grow up, they would be like these infantile adults, and that's just kind of gross. So we don't want to do that. So what do you do? You keep on going knowing that the fruit of parenting isn't realized until way down the road. And the church is much the same. We often try to stay as children. We remember the good feeling that we had at the beginning when we first came to God or we first found a new church body that we could make some friends in and we make friends and we go to the events and we have fun and we want to stay in that place. But then we continue on in our life and continue on in our journey and things get a little bit harder. And the enemy finds new ways to attack us. And the soil of our life gets a little bit harder and the sun gets a little bit hotter. And that feeling uh, becomes fleeting to an extent. And yet, so what we try to do is we try to keep replicating that feeling so that we can stay young and we forget that in the hard years of our life that there's something bigger coming. There's some reward at the end of it. God is taking us to a destination That's why we say come as you are but don't stay where you are because you're supposed to come to church and and come into the body of Christ and really come to Christ any way that you are. But God is moving us and moving you into a direction, into a future, and it's easy to forget that in those middle years when it gets hard. And so what I want to do is I want to weave a few scriptures together for you. I don't want this to be just my opinions my opinions aren't that great. I share them on Facebook and nobody responds. So I'm going to read some scripture and hopefully uh, that God and the power of his Holy Spirit through his holy word will give us some insight about how it works, how it works with the church. So I'm going to read Matthew chapter 13. I don't believe we have this on the screen because it's kind of long, but go ahead and follow along in your Bibles or your apps or whatever it is. Matthew 13, 3 through 8, and then I'm going to jump down to 18 through 23. Then he, Jesus, told them many things in parables, saying, 
A farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And then there's a break where the disciples are like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And then he goes on to explain it. Listen, then, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Listen to this scripture and go back and reread it if you have to because this is how it works. He says that someone re receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. How many times have the worries of this life or the deceitfulness of wealth, what we would call blessing, sometimes distract you from what God is doing in your life? But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So the way it works is that our job is to sow seeds. As believers in Christ, we are supposed to share the gospel. In Mark, it says, share the gospel with every living creature. In Matthew 28, it says, make disciples of all nations. And so we learn that we have to sow seed, and later in the epistles, we see that we have to nurture and water and grow and develop those seeds into mature followers, believers in Christ. The Apostle Paul says, I planted, but Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So it's pretty simple the way it works. We share the gospel. And then we cultivate disciples to be like Christ. And then through God and the power of his Holy Spirit, it produces a crop. Or in other words, it produces a harvest. So why does someone plant a seed? That's the question. Why am I out here planting a seed? You don't plant a seed to plant seeds. You plant seeds to have a harvest. We'll say, how long does it take to get to a harvest? A season. Every season is different. Every kind of seed that you plant has a different length of time, a different season. You know that an avocado tree won't yield fruit for eight years after it's planted. Some of you are like, oh, that's nothing. That's not, I got it all over avocado trees because it's been a long time. I need a harvest in my life. So how long does it take and how long is a season is what you say. And you're probably thinking, well, maybe too long. No, a season is as long as it needs to be. And this is what we can learn from what moms understand about the long game is that however long it takes, our goal is the harvest. Our goal is not to plant a seed or have a short season. Our goal is what are we going to get at the end? What is the result going to be at the end? And so the job of the church is to plant seeds and nurture seeds to grow to disciples. And that rarely happens overnight. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9 says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. See, what he's saying is don't forget. What did I say earlier is that we often forget. And so Paul, or Peter here, is saying don't forget because I know that we have, we're prone to forget this because in our haste and in our, our, our hurry and our worry, we are prone to forget this. He says, don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why is it taking so long? Because of love. Why is the thing that God is doing in your life taking so long? Because he loves you and he's working it out. Why is it taking so long for God to do this thing that we've been asking him to do, for him to, to grow the church in this way, or for him to reach the family that I have, the family members that I have that I lost, or to make an impact in my workplace? Because God is waiting on people to respond to him. And the reason why he's patient is because he loves them enough to wait. He loves you enough to wait and I believe that God is asking us to partner with him in more patience so the harvest is more plentiful. 
This is true of us as a church collectively, but it's also true of your individual life. You have to be patient with your spouse for the harvest in your marriage. You have to be patient at your work for the harvest in provision. You have to be patient with your kids for the harvest of them uh, becoming uh, adults, fully functioning, responsible, loving, caring, full of integrity adults. And, and, and right now, there is something in your life, I believe, that you have to be patient for, that you're l- waiting for a harvest. What I want to ask you to do if you're willing, is to go ahead and comment, uh, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching, comment something that you are, a harvest that you are waiting for, for God. Something that we can be praying for you in, something that we can be encouraging you in. Because I want us to not only talk about doing this, I want to be doing this together because God is asking us as the church to partner with him. And I believe that God has harvest coming for his people. That there is a destination. He says, pray for it. We're going to read that in just a second. He says, pray for it. And so I want to ask you to share what is the thing, what is the area of your life where you are wanting and hoping and trusting God for a harvest? You see, it's the great and patient love of God that makes things take what we think is too long. We think it's too long, but God is being patient because he wants a good result. See, God is waiting on people just like you. Maybe he's even waiting on you to get to where he is, and he says, I'm willing to wait, because for me, it's not about just planting a seed or just having this thing be quick. For me, I want a bountiful harvest. I believe some of you need to hear this. The season of your harvest is not measured by how short it is, but how bountiful it is. We have to get past the notion of, I want this thing to be over. You're going through some stuff right now and you've been waiting for it to be over, but the goal of challenges are not for them to be over, it's for them to be fruitful. This is why we go through challenges to produce a fruit on the other side. That's how it works. Moms understand that. They want to have a fast delivery. How many moms want to have a fast and painless delivery? But if you ask any mom out there that's about to give birth, they say, hey, would you rather have a fast delivery or would you rather have a healthy baby? Every single time they're going to say, I want to do whatever it takes, as long as it takes, as painful as it is to ensure that I'm going to have a healthy baby, that I'm going to have a bountiful harvest. We have to have with the things of God and with the kingdom of God. You just got to get it out of our head that it's even a consideration that, yeah, wouldn't it be great if it was all fast and pain-free? But that's not how it works all the time. This is how it works. It's like this. Difference between moms and dads. Picture this. It's Christmas morning in your family, right? What happens? Moms are doing the legwork. They've been at it for months. They've been eavesdropping on the kids' conversations, and they've been dropping hints and asking questions to try to understand what do the kids need, what do they want. They know what the situation with their pajamas and their socks and their clothes, and they're trying to understand, okay, where can we get the right things to fill in here and what's going to bring the most joy, and they're doing all of this legwork. And it's Christmas morning, and the dad comes in and drops a trampoline. Kapoor! Booyah! And he's the hero for the day. He's got the trampoline, and everyone's happy about it, happy about it, and, and great. But, but as the days go on, the trampoline, it's not exciting anymore. The trampoline starts to become like, oh, man, the trampoline's just taking up space in the yard. But they're still using the toothbrush, and they're still using the pajamas, and they're still using the socks, and they're still writing in that journal that the mom knew that they wanted, and they're still reading the books because the mom understood the long game. Moms understand that what's better for the kids is not always what's most immediate. And I believe that God would rather the church be bountiful and the harvest plentiful than the path be easy and the season short. As a church, we are banking on the long game, not the short win. And so to do that, we have to keep our eye on the harvest. We have to keep our eye on what matters. Now, we're a, we're a growing church, and we want to reach more people, and we want to encourage more people, and we want to have more positive interactions that lead to life change and transformation. But what I'm going to say right now, um, it's got a little bit, little bit bold, and I hope it doesn't turn anyone off, but I want to say that church is not about you. Church is about the harvest. We have to keep our eyes on the harvest. See, the farmer, he doesn't plant seeds because he likes planting seeds. Now, he might get to a point, and I hope that he would, get to a point where he enjoys planting seeds and he finds the work fulfilling, but not because seed planting itself is fulfilling. The reason why he finds the seed planting fulfilling is because he's looking towards the harvest. 
And in a church, it's the same thing. There's so many things that we're called to do and we're called to be and we're called to work on. And we find that fulfilling, not because that work itself is so exciting, but because we look at the harvest and what keeps the farmer going year after year and cultivating that soil and turning over those fields is because he knows there's a harvest coming. And as Christians, what happens is we get all excited and we're like, oh, planting seeds is a blast. And we're planting seeds and it's fun and it's new. And what happens, like we just read in the parable, is the sun comes up and the soil gets hard. We realize, man, this is not as fun as I thought it was. And we start to lose sight of what God is really calling us to. But if we keep our eye on the harvest, we get through that time. And not only do we get through that time, we thrive in that time and we start to look forward to it, just like the farmer looks forward to planting those seeds and watering those crops and seeing the little bud turn up. And it might seem like it's taking too long, but he knows there's a harvest coming. As a church, I believe that we have to move. We have to move ourselves from craving the experience to desiring the harvest. And so I'm glad that there are people who are missing the gathering, and I'm glad there are people who are missing the connectivity and the different meetings and the classes and the groups that we have because that's a great and healthy expression of church. But we have to be thinking more about the harvest than the experience because when the sun comes up and the soil is hard, you're gonna forget how fun it is to plant seeds. And if you don't remember that your ultimate goal is the harvest, we're going to give up. We have to remember that we're playing the long game. So what does that mean for us right now in this season as we watch church online and as we break our normal rhythms and as we take kind of this time out in life, what does it mean for us? I think it means that we have to gear up for a harvest. We have to get ready. It means that we have to get ready for more planting. We have to be equipped to share our faith. We have to be patient in the long game. And it's actually not going to be very long, even though it seems like a long time, and maybe I'm signaling here a little bit, it's not going to be very long before we are meeting again, face to face, hugging each other. And that might take a little while, but we're going to get there. And, and, and interacting and, and having all the things that we, that we love and, and that we have enjoyed about being part of the body of Christ is not going to be that long before that comes back. But we need to get our heads back in the game because breaks are nice, but there's sowing to be done because there's a harvest coming. Take a look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Jesus is acknowledging here that he needs workers in the field. He says, pray for it. And I want to ask you to pray that God would send workers into this field, that he would send workers into Moon Valley, and that he would send workers into North Phoenix and all the surrounding metro. Pray that God would would prepare people, prepare maybe even you if you're watching this, to start sowing seeds, to start sharing your faith, to start gearing up by reading the word and spending time in prayer and listening to God, Lord, what is the direction that you have for me in my life? Because there's a harvest coming. But uh, to reap a harvest, you have to have workers in the field. And so we're praying for that as a church. Jesus is calling you out into the field. Are you praying for it? So I wanna say, why not take this time that we have right now a little bit of a downtime, a little bit of a break from the normal routine and go ahead and get started. If, you, if you've been part of this church for a while but you've been sitting on the sidelines or maybe you just started watching uh, since we went online and have been doing the online services but you've been sitting there wondering what God has next for your life, I wanna let you know that you can now take the Belong course online. It's belong.citizensofphoenix.org. And from there, you can start the process and start the journey of following God and saying, you know what? I want to get prepared because I believe that there's a harvest coming. So I want to wrap up with this acknowledgement. Life is hard. Life can be really hard and challenging sometimes. Moms know that. But more importantly, God knows that. God knows your situation. And sometimes it can feel like it's a little bit of a wasted effort. You say, why am I doing all of this stuff that I'm doing? But I believe that there is a harvest coming. I want to read this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. And he says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to, the, uh, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. 
So do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. He spells it out right here. He's saying there's an opportunity to become weary when we're operating in our flesh, when we're trying to make sense of everything around us. But if we can sow to the Spirit, if we can live in spiritual things, if we can share our faith and give glory to God and worship together and pursue him in the way that we talked about last week and the week before, there's an opportunity. And what he's saying is this reminder here, don't give up. Don't grow tired because there is a harvest coming. And so every time that you have the opportunity, he says, go do something good. Be a light to someone, especially those who are the family of faith. And so if you've been thinking about somebody who's you know, part of the church or outside the church, some friend circles or whoever that is, and, and you've been wanting to encourage them, do it. You've been wanting to share a scripture with somebody, do it. You've been wanting to pray for somebody, do it. He's saying every time you have an opportunity, go ahead and do it because there is a harvest coming. And what, he, what I get from this verse as I read this scripture is that you have to believe that your work is worth it. We have teams right now who are doing all kinds of work behind the scenes. They have to believe that the work is worth it. And so believers and followers of Christ and leaders in this church, you have to trust that the effort and perseverance that you're putting forth will advance the kingdom of God. What you are doing is sowing to the Spirit. And we have to trust that it's that's, uh, we who plant and we who water, but God gives the growth. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whoever sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reach eternal life. And that right there, that understanding, that promise from God should give us encouragement to continue on when, we, when we're tempted to be weary, when we're tempted to not take the opportunity to keep pressing in because we know that in the Spirit we are sowing things that will lead to eternal life, not just for us, but for the people around us, the people that we care about. This is how it works. And it's the only way, it's the only possible way that you will not become weary in doing good. The last verse I want to read is Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You have a choice in this season, right now, if you're going to sow to the spirit or if you're going to sow to the flesh. If you're going to do what's immediate or if you're going to focus on the long game. Are you going to say, I want what I want right now or I want what God wants whenever it's ready? You have a choice to be captivated by fear and anxiety and to indulge in whatever it is you're craving or to press into God and to get ready for the work that he's called you to do. The work that he's called you to do so that we can be like Christ, to keep your eyes on the prize. And so I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't be discouraged because there is a harvest coming. And I believe that there is a solution to your situation and there is an outcome for whatever it is that you're involved in and there is certainty in your circumstance. And so I want to ask you, there is a harvest coming. Who's ready? Who's ready for what God is going to do? We're believing that God will double our impact in 2020. We said that in January during Vision Month, God, that we believe that God is going to double our impact in 2020. And man, I'll tell you what, this spring has put some, put some doubt and put some question in our minds, but we are still believing that God is going to double our impact, who's ready? We believe that there are walls that need to come down in your life, who's ready? That there is soil that needs to be softened, who's ready? That there's some watering that needs to happen in your life, who is ready? I believe that there's some gospel that needs to be shared, that there's some worship and some praise that needs to be given to God. And I'm asking you, who is ready for the harvest that is coming? I believe that there are people in your life who need you to reach out and touch them with the hope of the gospel. Who's ready to deliver that message? There's some prayer that needs to open up the floodgates of God's power in your life, in your family, in this church, and in this community. Who is ready for the harvest that God is bringing? If you're ready for the harvest, I know this is going to be weird because you're in your living room, but go ahead and raise your hand right where you're at. We may not be together physically, but we are together in spirit. And if you're ready to put the work in, and you're ready to think on the long game, and you're ready to do whatever it takes to plant the seed and to water the seed and to press in and to look ahead because you're ready for the harvest, go ahead and raise your hand and pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, 
we believe in your promises. Lord, we believe that your promises are true. We believe that there is a harvest coming. And so we pray to you, the Lord of the harvest, that you would come with your power, Lord, that you would move in our situation, that you would give us your level of patience, your level of love, Lord, that we could see your kingdom, your heavenly kingdom come to earth. Lord, our desire is to see your will. And Lord, I pray that you would break through the strongholds in people's life. Lord, I pray that you would break through doubt and that you would break through fear and that you would break through complacency, Lord. I pray that you would take the shackles off the workers who have been sitting on the sidelines, Lord, and that you would get them out into the field. I pray, Lord, that we would not be trying to just chase a feeling or have a good time or just be excited to be together again, although all those things are good, Lord. I pray that you would empower us to be spiritually minded, to have care for those who are far from you, Lord, to have desire to bring people to you, and most of all, Lord, to be empowered to be like Christ. Lord, we just confess as a church that we're ready and we're waiting and we're proactive and we're pursuing because we love you, Lord. We trust in your promises. We lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.